Welcome to Man vs. Meeple, the show where we talk about everything board game related. I am Jeremy Salinas, a.k.a. Drakenstrike, and I'm here with David Waybright, my co-host. How's it going, everyone? We have a very special Gen Con 2016 guest with us. The incredible designer, Martin Wallace, is on our set with us. Say hello, Martin. Uh, hi, folks. Hi there. <laughs> hi, Jeremy. Hi, David. Thanks for having me over. Absolutely. Thank you for so, coming. So, Martin, you've developed uh, and designed over 40 games right now, uh, dating back all the way to 1999. Am I right? No. Probably even before that, right? <laughs> no, no, no? No, no. I thought we had this conversation. Or did I have this conversation <laughs> with somebody? Else? No, you see, this is the problem. If you rely on the geek, it only goes back so far. But uh-huh. there was a time before the internet and computers. And there was? Th- <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was, unless we are all living in the matrix. Um, but yeah, I actually started, I did my first design in 1992, self-published it, which was Lords of Creation, which we redid in 1994 in a proper box format okay um, so really we kind of i kind of started in 1992 that's when i when i date things from wow. yeah it's a long time and it i think it's time. more than 40 i think it's actually about 70 but i don't know whether you include the expansions so i don't know so you've been doing this for a long time you've had yeah. a lot of success in the industry tell tell our audience a little bit about yourself oh god um I mean, what about me generally? Yeah, it's about you. Yeah, what got you into games? What got you started? uh, I mean, I think like a lot of gamers, it's kind of something, you know, when you're a kid, there's just, there's some kids who are just kind of attracted to games and so forth. So it's like, you know, like even enjoying Monopoly, you know, actually looking forward to Christmas because you get a game of Monopoly Mm -hmm. Um, because that's all it's on offer. But also as a kid, you know, when you're playing with your toy soldiers thinking, oh yeah, if we add some dice here, we can roll some dice and do a little bit of figure gaming. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and I I think a lot of people kind of get into gaming then. So that then led, uh, there was a teacher at my high school who was a board gamer and a figure gamer, and he started a games club. And I thought, okay, yeah, cool, let's try that. Joined that, um, and that got me into uh, the American War Games. Um, do you remember SPI? You, mm, no, Simulations no. Mm. Publications mm-hmm. Incorporated. You, 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 you've remember that? <laughs> God, they used to turn out loads of games, and um, yeah, because I think the first, the first proper. Uh, game I bought was SPI's uh, Star Force. Okay. okay. Which I was like 13 or something. And this is a game that involves advanced trigonometry. It wasn't a simple Whoa. space game. It was frighteningly complicated. <laughs> it was like, oh my God. Because it it, everything's three dimensional. It's like a three dimensional representation of the universe. So your, your ships don't move in, on the flat, they move in three dimensions, which is why you have to do three, you, you have to work out vectors and distances between places. So it's like, yeah, when totally the, unplayable. But, <laughs> when was this? This is, oh God, this would be 1977. Oh my God. Like that was three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah, a little yeah. older than three, but uh, I wasn't doing advanced uh, trigonometry. Yeah, it, I mean, it helped me with my math. It really did. It's like because understanding that it just really helped me with my uh, math. Oh, that's, a that. that's a great point. So, so, the, so, got into those kind of war games. Did some figure gaming. Joined the local figure games club. Um, and then when I got to, we call it six forms. This is college you go to, you know, like sixteen to eighteen. Mm-hmm. So we call it six form. So when it's the sixth form, uh, one of the guys there had discovered Dungeons and Dragons. And again, this is when it had just reached the UK. Okay. So it wasn't the original white book, it was the blue book. Uh-huh. If, okay, so yeah, it's yeah. kind of the second edition of DD. So this is the point where you couldn't even get the dice. So there were no <laughs> there were no uh, extra adventures out there. You basically got the rules and then you just went with it. But that that discovery and then it was just incredible it just blew your mind it was just like wow this is so different from anything out there yeah, right. it was just incredible so uh so yeah so we did D and then we also play you know still playing the long uh avalon hill and spi games so you know got into squad leader um diplomacy all sorts of stuff and then mm-hmm. games workshop um opened up a shop in Manchester. They, they, they originally had a shop down in Hammersmith, down in London, and they were pretty much the only proper game shop in the UK. Um, and then, so if, if you're into games, everything, you pretty much bought everything by mail order. There was, you couldn't walk into a shop and buy a game. Uh, it's all mail order. So they then opened a shop in Manchester, and I got a. I started with a Saturday job and then ended up working full-time for them, and that was kind of my like gaming education, because this was, See, 
Games Workshop now is just a war hammer. Yeah. It's just yeah we do figures right. we do this but then it, when they first started they did everything so what were you designing games back then oh god no, no 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 what were you doing for them uh, I was just working as a shop assistant okay oh. but this, this is the old uh, games workshop of Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson okay so they, they made their initial money because they were the sole importers of Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. so they, they got uh, I mean there's a story there in itself you know it's like how many times can one guy be so lucky because uh, like Ian Livingston Steve Jackson it's like oh let's pick up the license for importing Dungeons and Dragons just before it goes kaboom <laughs> so they make a fortune off that they then think oh well, why don't we do some of these uh, kind of adventure books so they did the fighting yeah. fantasy adventure books yeah, kind of like the choosing and adventure yeah, yeah and it's kaboom and then Ian Livingston they go, I think I'll buy a computer company so he bought a computer company just before they released Lara Croft and it's like <laughs> it's so lucky it's just it's not fair <laughs> it's just you know once would be fine but three times like, oh yeah I just buy that oh it's yeah it's got mega again yeah it's enough gone, right yeah it's just, oh. but yeah but that this is a shop and it had everything so I could spend my days just looking at all these different games you know war games fantasy role playing games so it's, it's, it's a good grounding because um, it's certainly an issue nowadays you know you, you, you might come across somebody who said oh I've designed this game it does this this and, and then they think it's original I think actually I, I, I've seen that before that, right. that's been done before yeah. Uh, so yeah it's nice having that, that kind of grounding in all of these kind of older school games. It's very interesting. Um, so when was it that you really started in full designing games? Well, I, I kind was of... Was that 1992? Uh, yeah, I kind of drifted away from gaming for a while. I, I, I went back to college, got a degree, uh, then trained as a history teacher. And for a while, I kind of just wasn't doing a lot of gaming. Uh, and then for some bizarre reason, around about 1990, it was just about the time of the, uh, my first child arrived, I thought, I fancy being a game designer. And I, I have no, I don't know, it may have been God telling me, I don't know, or it just may have been a random thing. And mm -hmm. it's just, I thought, yeah, I fancy being a game designer. It's, that's interesting that you were a history uh, teacher. Hmm. Did that have a, a role to play? Because typically your games have fallen into two categories. Um, the construction of railroads, mm. which you're famously known for, mm. <laughs> and then the the rise and fall of civilizations. Yes. I mean, those seem to be the two areas. But recently, in the past several years, you've started to venture off into some games that have really become popular. Games like London, mm. um, Discworld, uh, Study of Study, Emerald. Yeah. Um, is that by choice, or is it... Um. Just a change in design direction? It was, actually it's not. It's just applying the same principle. So the thing is, yeah, I mean, if you if you study history, I mean, basically I did my history degree, it's like, oh God, what do I do with a history degree? It's like, eh, I'm a teacher. Because that's pretty much all you could do with it. Mm -hmm. Sure. But it's also a good grounding for being a game designer because yeah what I what I with a lot of my games I have to do a lot of research sure and basically it, studying history is all you're doing is learning how to read dull books without falling asleep <laughs> I mean, that's that's it you know <laughs> you know if you can stay awake then you, you, you can do it. So, um, so and, and it's that again, same principle. You, within, uh, you know, when you're studying history, it's like, yeah, you have to read all this stuff and, and then you have to condense it. You have to say, right, pick out the main points and present them in an essay. Sure. And in a board game, you're doing the same thing. You, you're reading a whole load of stuff and then you're trying to pick out the key points and then present that in a board game form. So, yeah, you, 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 there, there is a crossover. There, there is a skill set that you gain through the study of history that you can apply to designer board games. Sure. Now, when you're talking about going in different directions, I'm not. The way you know, the way I approached London was exactly the same way as I approached Discworld, which is you do the research, you pick out the key principles, and then you apply them in the game. It just happens that London, you're reading actual history and disc world you're reading stuff that's been made up but in one sense it's actually no difference sure you know you, 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 you're trying to take the, the central elements from the disc world universe and say what what are the important things what are the core things that need to be represented in this game mm -hmm. and then how do we model that sure so Very so do you see more because like Jeremy said some of the themes of some of your at least on a theme level mm. 
of the more recent stuff has been less in the way of civilization building mm -hmm. and like even the most recent via nebula yeah well it, i think has a lot of the spirit of some of your earlier games the theme is very unique and different Mm -hmm. um, as well as the Hit Z Road, which is coming out yes. at yeah. Gen Con as well, which I've just seen a little bit about. I yes. haven't been able to play that one. Yeah. But no, no, neither have I. I have no idea what they've done to it yet. So <laughs> I'm demoing. I think I, I hope I get the rules right because uh, that will be embarrassing. Um, yeah, I mean Via Nebula. Yeah, it doesn't quite fit. I mean, the thing is Via Nebula. I mean, anybody who knows my games to say, yeah, this is based on Brass and Age of Steam. And uh -huh. like, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's basically taking the element of brass of opening up minds, creating resources that every, any other people can use. Uh, and I try to present it in uh, a more streamlined manner. Um, so yes, in that case, there was no studying required. It is very much based around the, the, the coming up with a set of mechanisms. I mean, the theme itself was applied by Space Cowboys. I didn't uh -huh. say, oh, it's going to have pink pigs in it and stuff like <laughs> that. They, they, they did all of that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of an exception to that. But, but in a sense, though, it is derived from a game where I had done a lot of research. But you see, see the, the, the way I see it, I mean, I, some people kind of, can be kind of critical and say, oh, this is just a dumbed-down version or something. And I kind of think, well, you know, in the real world, it's like with motorsport racing. I mean, you don't have Formula 1 have it, but in Europe you have Formula 1, and you have this these very expensive, high-performance machines which whiz around the track at 250 miles an hour or whatever, and you think, well, what a waste of time. But the thing is, there's a lot of technology that's developed to do that that then finds its way into your standard cars. It's dumbed down a bit, but it's tested there, and then it, it spreads out into general cars. And I think it's a similar thing here. You know, you can have your high-performance game, which... Uh, you, you know, it's, it's going to get a lot of critical success, but it's not going to make you a lot of money because it's only going to sell to a small number of people because mm -hmm. that's the nature of more complex games. Um, but you can take elements of that, you know, the things that you think are the good things, and you can put them in a form that is going to appeal to a wider market. Yeah, so Via Nebula, uh, one way to look at that would be maybe sort of the essence of brass. Yes. But in a more accessible yes. format. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely compelling to me as well. Mm. I mean, I play a wide variety of games, but I am a sucker for that sort of presentation. Mm. So yeah. uh, mm. I've played one and a half games of Via Nebula before okay. we started filming. Yeah. We have a couple questions for mm. you that have come from some of our audience members mm -hmm. that, that watch our show. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question or not, That's but I'm okay. going to try. Okay. There's a lot of people that debate, is Brass your best game? Is Age of Steam? Is Steam? If you were to leave one legacy, if you were to say, this is the, the best game I've made, this is what I want people to remember me for, what would that game be? Oh, that's a difficult question. Yeah, it's like uh, picking your favorite child, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I, 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 see, the thing that... See, part of me would have said Age... I think Age of Steam was like the first game that really kind of... It didn't necessarily do big in sales, but it was like a proper success. It was a critical, success. critical, yeah. Yeah. critical yeah. success. And yeah, compared to the other games we were doing at the time, it was successful because we actually did a reprint. I mean, things like Princes of the Renaissance mm -hmm. or uh, Empires of the Ancient World, all of those games, we did one print run and then that was it. We were done. We, we, we never got enough sales to do another print run. And Age of Steam was the first game we did where, oh my God, we sold out. People want more. We'll do another print run. Um, the problem with Age of Steam, though, is kind of like, yeah, the well's kind of been poisoned because of the issue between myself and John Borer over... Because I, I don't know how familiar you are with, but there was a whole nasty, messy mm -hmm. thing oh. that happened with that. So you've ended up with... So basically, that game has now continued to be published, and I don't get... I don't get a cent for it. I mean, effectively, the game's been stolen from me. Oh. So it's hard to oh. be fond of something that's been taken from you. Sure. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah, I would 100% agree. I can imagine. Uh, being creative, I mean, it seems like you're a very creative type person. <laughs> mm. And losing that license or losing that ability to claim it is. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Disappointing. So, yeah. in a sense, but, the, you know, so, but yeah, still, what is it my favorite? Not sure. I mean, brass. See, with, with brass, that was an old one because when I when I designed the game, I thought well, this is okay, but uh, I don't know how it's going to do it. So I was quite amazed 
when it became really popular. I think, hmm, didn't see that coming. Um, for a while, I always thought automobile was my best design because I just liked the, the, the cleanness of the system. Um, automobile is kind of a... I feel like automobile is one of your best games because it's kind yeah. of a war game mixed into a very strategic car yes. game. Yes. It's very combative. It can be very combative trying yes. to get those certain places on the board. Mm. Um, that's a phenomenal game. Yeah. I, don't know, you I, have, I have not played Automobile. Yeah, yeah. you've got to play that yeah. game. It's a thinky game, for sure. Yes. A very thinky yes. game. But uh, at the moment, because I know we're going to be plugging later, actually at the moment, my favorite game is this one, A Handful of Stars. Let's just show oh, that to yeah. the camera. Uh, so which this one? is part of your uh, few acres of snow type mechanic, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. But and this I, one's coming out when? Uh, we'll be publishing this later this year. Don't pin me down today. It will not be available for Essen. Okay, uh, okay. I'm going to be I'm going to be running um, demos of the game at Essen. Okay. Um, so if people want to play it there, they, they can play it there. Absolutely. If they get there quick enough, but it'll be sometime before December. Okay. Um, but the thing, I mean, I this has been in development for about four or five years now. So it's not it's not a quickie. It's not like something I did last week. Sure. Because some some of the games they are. It's like yeah, I did this last week. Right. And. Yeah. But this has been on and off in development for quite a while. So I spent a lot of time kind of knocking the rough edges off. And, oh, wow. And when I play now, it's like I don't get tired of playing. You know, some games, it's like, yeah, I'm kind of done with that sure. now. But every time you play this, it's a different board. And it's just weird. It's like, wow, I've not, not seen that board formation before. And the thing is, you'll never see it again. Because of the way the board works, you will never see the same map. And it does throw up really interesting situations. And this is built off the same engine of a few acres of snow. Yes, right? it's, it's got the same, uh, yeah, so you've got the same uh, deck cycling thing. Sure. So um, where where I think it, it really scores over a few acres of, uh, a few acres of snow is in a few acres of snow, you you don't generally have a position that you, you, you control locations, mm -hmm. but the position of your army is nebulous. It's wherever the fight is, that's where you send your mm -hmm. army. Whereas in a handful of stars, you, your spaceships are on the board. They have a position. And okay. when you want to move, you've got to pay energy and you've got to move them to where you want them to go. But what it does, it means with combat, the, way, the, the, the thing that makes it interesting is when you attack somebody, there's this kind of seesaw battle it's kind of a tug of war but the other person can move forces in to their defense they can move well each side can keep piling more and more forces in depending on their position on the map so you do have to think about where your forces are positioned you have to think right uh, this area over here is a little bit weak am I going to beef this one up because um, can I you know is this person likely to attack me or not mm -hmm. so you, it means you're having to kind of think strategically and tactically Hmm. Sure. which add, adds a new dimension to it. But the essence of the rules, the, the rules themselves have been stripped down. So I mean, a simple example, in a few acres of snow, if you wanted to do something at a location, you'd have to play the location card and then play additional cards right. to do that. And this used to be the same way. Thought, nah, well, one of my playtesters was getting grumpy because saying, ah, I can never get to do anything because I don't have the right cards. I thought, fine, I'll take that rule out. It's like, no, you, you can do whatever you want, wherever you want. You don't have to have the location card for that. So, And it actually freed the game up nicely. So, it's, yeah, if you want to build ships somewhere, just pay the build ship cost. If you want to move something, yeah, you, you, you can move whatever you want as long as you pay the energy. So the, you're not having to... Rem there's not as many hurdles to jump to do what it is that you want to do. Sure. So you, you can so, focus more on like, this is what I really want to do. And yes, I've got the stuff to do it. Bang, that's what I'm going to so do. So more streamlined, less yeah. sort of stifling, if you will. Yes, of, yeah, hmm. yeah. But there, there's, but you've got a range of different technologies you can employ. Um, again, one of the other neat twists, and it, sometimes in kind of empire building games, you get the, the whole, yeah, I can't get to you because the other guy's in the way kind of mm -hmm. thing. But what you have in this, you, you, you have normal ship travel, which is point to point, but then you have wormholes. So if the wormhole technology card comes out, you can get wormholes and certain systems have wormholes and you can travel from one wormhole to another. So all of a sudden, one the one system on one side of the board and another system on another side of the board, effectively they're next to each other. Hmm. So you can just say, Oh, I can go to the other side of the board and 
do horrible stuff to somebody over there. <laughs> if all of this doesn't make sense, stay tuned, guys. We yeah. will film a brief walkthrough yeah. of uh, yeah, yeah. a handful of stars for you guys. So that'll be in a secondary video to this mm. one. David, do you have any other questions for Martin? You know, I, I, most of my questions revolved around Via Nebula and Hit Zero. Right, okay. So, yeah, okay. Um, cool. I, I think I got all of mine out. I'm, I'm anxious to get a, a closer look at Handful of Stars, though. I do have one question for you. You're here yep. to celebrate Gen Con. Yes. Is there any game that you're excited to see from another designer or a friend, possibly? At the oh, yeah, this is actually... Ooh. Um, that's been put on the spot, isn't it? Oh, God. <laughs> uh... Not necessarily like, your there's favorite. There's so but. many games coming out, and it's like, uh, what things did I want to try? Or oh. or if there's a recent one that you've played that you thought was particularly good. Uh, Not your own. Uh, <laughs> well, you see, yeah, you see, I don't get to play that many commercial games because a lot of my playtesting time is spent Gaming course, time spent yeah, playtesting, and the kind of because of where I game, there's there's not many gamers. We have we have a meeting pretty much Thursday evening, and I've missed quite a few of them. It's been really annoying because there's one game that I had a lot of good stuff about that I wanted to try, Mombasa, and that sounded really interesting. And it's like fantastic game. And it's like, well, the the, the guys I game with, they've been playing it repeatedly for like the last couple of months so I know by the time I get down there it'll be like yeah we played that to death now like, <laughs> and I, I had that before with other games there have been other games that I've really wanted to play and because I've been out of the loop for a while by the time I get down there so like, yeah we're bored of that now we're on to the next <laughs> thing well I don't thing, think but... anybody will care that you're out of the loop because yeah. you keep designing right. games yes. for us yeah. exactly thank you Martin for being okay. um, stay, stay tuned with us guys we will come right back and show you a handful of stars I am Jeremy Salinas I'm David Wavering and we'll see you guys again on Man vs. Meeple thank okay. you bye bye Bye.